seat belts and hold on tight. We're about to take you on a heart-pumping adventure through some of the most awesome scenes ever captured on film. Where surprises lurk around every corner and a brush with death is worth the thrill of feeling alive. These are National Geographic's most amazing moments. You're in for a wild ride. From ferocious baboons to a hurricane in the house, from a mile-high freefall to the jaws of a mighty shark, these incredible scenes will compete for the title of Most Amazing Moment. Coming at you in five spine-tingling categories. Unexpected killers. Deadly animal encounters. Don't let go of that head! I'm not hurting that head! Amazing discoveries. Nature's fury. And adventures in the danger zone. All I could think was, I have no business dying here. Experience for yourself our most daring and incredible journeys as we count down our top stories of heart-stopping excitement. In the natural world, predators rule. And prey run for their lives. At the top of the food chain, the big boys have some killer moves. Long-range vision. Cunning strategy. Astounding agility. Blazing speed. When it's dinner time, these natural born hunters will go all out for a good meal. This polar bear takes on walruses two times his weight to get to a treat. A helpless walrus pup. You may think you've seen it all before. Now forget everything you know about the animal kingdom. about to get a chilling glimpse of unexpected killers. These scenes are bizarre. Ferocious baboons, fearsome frogs, and hippos in a frenzy. These are jaw-dropping, startling, and just plain amazing moments. This sea eagle likes an unusual takeout treat poisonous snake fresh from the sea the bird will have to hold on tight not to lose her lunch and her life a seal sunny day at the beach goes haywire when a killer whale springs from the sea to attack scare you? How about one that pounces like a cat? Try running from this hungry lady. But what's next is even more incredible. In our next amazing moment, a baboon goes hunting for a surprising meal. A 
vast flock of migrating birds has gathered at this lake. Baboons don't usually eat flamingos, but this one finds the huge crowd irresistible. He plunges into the startled mass of birds. The flamingos flee for their lives. But the baboon's too fast and strong. And its teeth are long and sharp like a leopard's. <laughs> the baboon nails its prey with one bite. The peaceful lake has become a killing ground. A new foods now on the menu. You won't be skinny dipping anytime soon after you check out our next unexpected killer. In this amazing moment, witness the incredible appetite of a voracious horde. For young egrets, first flight can be a dangerous introduction to the world. A fall from the nest is not unusual. But here, something lurks below the surface. And it's pulling the bird under. It tries to escape. But it's too late. gang of piranhas is eating the bird alive. Hundreds of razor-sharp teeth shred the thrashing bird. The egret's desperate kicks only fuel their feeding frenzy. Within minutes, the feast is finished, and the piranhas go in search of their next meal. The ferocious fish clean the flesh off the egret's bones in mere moments. Next, a band of winged warriors is on a mission. Thirty hornets are converging on a hive of European honeybees, a species not native to Japan. Inside the hive is something the hornets want. Larvae, pupae, and honey so sweet it's to die for. These two-inch long giant hornets are perfectly designed predators. Their stingers pump out a venom so strong it can dissolve human flesh. The Japanese hornets are outnumbered a thousand to one. But the European bees haven't had time to evolve a defense against the hornet's shearing mandibles. The hornet vanguard chomps their way through the front line. The bees defend the hive. But it's quickly clear, they are no match for the hornet forces who take no prisoners. Within minutes, they storm their way in and start shredding their way through the entire hive. Finally, the spoils of war. The hornets drink the honey and, like barbarians, carry off the bees' young. In the raiders' wake lies a battlefield strewn with the dead and dying.
In just three hours, 30 hornets have massacred 30,000 bees. Think you have nothing to fear? Every year, dozens of people die from a severe reaction to this hornet sting. The Grim Reaper can take unexpected forms. Not all killers inspire fear. Who could be frightened by this little guy? These bullfrogs seem harmless enough. Unless you're a tarantula. Or a mouse. Or a bird. Or a scorpion? They'll eat anything they can fit in their mouths. And for dessert, maybe something crunchy. How about Junior? But even the bullfrog can be foiled. In our next amazing moment, he tries out a new food with bizarre results. This innocent-looking newt enters the frog's field of attack. The frog strikes and swallows. The newt looks like a goner, but the battle's not over. The newt's skin contains a deadly poison. Within minutes, the frog is dead. struts away victorious. Facing death, the newt secretes bacteria-laden poison to paralyze and kill his would-be predator. Our most amazing story reveals even more unexpected behavior. This is a familiar hippo scene, an herbivore at rest. Although these animals look gentle, they can be aggressive, especially when dominance in the herd is at stake. This mother and her new calf have practiced approaching the herd for weeks. The calf's future depends on a good introduction. But a young male isn't in a welcoming mood. The new baby is not his offspring. What happens next has only been witnessed a handful of times. The male challenges the mother. She dashes for safety with her calf at her heels. But the water gets muddy. The calf loses his way and the male hippo turns on the defenseless youngster. In what might be an attempt to assert his place in the herd, he takes the infant into his mouth and shakes. The baby struggles. He doesn't stand a chance. go under.
mother tries to revive him, but he's gone. The bull has made sure that this calf won't grow up to be a threat. Mother Nature has nasty mood swings. Her anger takes many forms. Raging power. Awesome shows of strength. Disasters of a deadly magnitude. We're no match for Mother Nature. So when we face off, the drama is intense. You'll want to run for cover when you see what's coming up next. We'll take you directly into the path of Earth's most violent forces. A hurricane in the house. An avalanche at the top of the world. A duel with a monster tornado. And fire-breathing mountains that will demolish entire towns. What you're about to see will blow you away. Hurricanes pack a deadly punch with violent winds, torrential rains, and devastating floods. In our first story, a Florida family fights for their lives in the eye of the storm. August 22nd, 1992. A hurricane named Andrew is picking up steam in the Atlantic. But meteorologist Stan Goldenberg has other things on his mind. On the 23rd, his wife Barbara is in labor. As they await the birth of their fourth child, Andrew hurdles towards their home. But outside, Stan sees no sign yet of its fury. Waiting for the hurricane, beautiful skies. Calm, you never know what was gonna happen here in the next 12 to 14 hours or so. By early evening, daughter Pearl is born. Makes you feel like a daddy, right? There you go. But the celebration is short-lived. Barbara and Pearl will stay in the hospital while Stan races home to ride out the storm with the rest of his family. All around Southern Florida, residents brace for Andrew's onslaught. We have the family here. That night, Stan shoots this video of his three boys, his sister-in-law, and her family. Joseph, Aaron, Reuben. They know it'll be a rough night. They have no idea that they're going to come face to face with a monster. After midnight, Miami gets a taste of things to come. But this is nothing. At 4.30 a.m., Andrew slams into the coast full force. Winds whip at 165 miles an hour. It's a Category 5 hurricane, the most intense there is. In this bad boy's path, nothing and no one are safe. Uh, looks like our TVs are out. Maybe the power is out now for the duration. Barbara can't reach Stan on the phone. You can hear that outside. You can start to hear the roar outside. Andrew rips the plywood from their windows and starts peeling back the roof. Determined to keep his family calm, Stan puts on a brave face. Lord, we just thank you. We ask your protection. As the hurricane kicks it up another notch, it's hard to believe the Goldenbergs can survive. Well, 
By 8.30 a.m., Andrew's blown past. But Barbara Goldenberg has no idea if her family is alive or dead. It did not look possible that anybody could be alive. And that was just a mile or two from my house. And at that point, I, I really felt despair. 160,000 people in the Miami area are suddenly homeless. 44 are dead. And as the hours pass, there is no phone call to let Barbara know that her family's made it through the night. Barbara's neighborhood is demolished. Her house is smashed to bits. This is all that remains of the kitchen where her family was holed up. Then, finally, a call comes in. I still remember the first time I got through to her on the phone. You know, I just wept. I mean, it wasn't just the excitement of getting through to her. It was me pouring out the emotions of what I had been through. I mean, we had been through an incredible experience. This wall fell on us, containing the refrigerator, the stove, cabinets, all fell on top of us. And that small space you're looking at the mattress and everything, that's where we were pinned and protected during the worst part of the storm. With their home ripped apart around them, Stan and his family survived one of the fiercest hurricanes in history. Lord, we just thank you. We ask your protection. In our next story, a cameraman stares down white death at the top of the world. Annapurna may only be the 10th highest peak on Earth, but it's four times deadlier than Everest. It kills one out of every five climbers who tries to conquer it. Its most lethal weapon? The avalanche. Get caught in one of these babies and you'll be smacked down and sucked under at the same time. If you don't die instantly, you could be suffocated to death under feet of snow. Still, fearless climbers return to Annapurna year after year. October 1997. Brothers Jose and Jesus Novas of Spain are out to conquer the mountain. Nos vemos. Yeah. Cameraman Alejandro Rocha stays behind to film their attempt. Odds are, one of the brothers may not make it home. Tons of fresh snow cling to the mountain's steep slopes. Annapurna is now a ticking time bomb. The brothers forge ahead anyway. Soon, they are mere specks in the distance. Then, as Alejandro films, his worst fears come true. A colossal torrent of snow and ice crashes over the climbers. Avalanches can reach speeds of 80 miles per hour. This one is thundering straight towards Alejandro. He can't bear to face his killer. He retreats to his tent. This is the face of a man waiting for death. avalanche grinds to a halt just a few yards from Alejandro's tent. His life has been spared. But what about Jose and Jesus? No one 
responds. They could be anywhere under the snow, crushed by the avalanche, or buried alive. Alejandro searches with his camera for any signs of life. Suddenly, he spots something on the side of the mountain. He can't believe his eyes. An overhanging ledge has protected Jose and Jesus as the avalanche steamrolled over them. The brothers are thrilled to be alive. <laughs> With nowhere to run, nowhere to hide, Alejandro and the Novas brothers survive a death blow from the planet's most dangerous peak. Most of us run from nature's fury. Now, a guy who heads straight for it. Springtime in the Plain States is prime time for tornadoes. With winds raging up to 300 miles an hour, Tornadoes kill more than 80 Americans a year and can flatten a town in seconds. June 24, 2003. Storm chaser Tim Samaras is in Tornado Alley looking for trouble. This thing turned into a big gust front. His goal, to place as many scientific probes as possible directly in the path of a giant twister. The trick, do it without getting killed. The perfect conditions are forming near a tiny hamlet called Manchester. Tim and his teammates drive towards a massive thundercloud. About seven miles out, a funnel starts taking shape. He tries to get closer, but no roads lead in the right direction. He outraces the tornado for a few miles. We took the road heading east, basically going right into the path of the tornado. One probe down, five to go. Oh, we gotta get a hit. We gotta get a hit. The chasers estimate it's at least an F4 tornado with winds over 200 miles an hour. A twister this fierce can level a well-built house and turn a mobile home into a missile. That was good, yes, I think. Tim's probes will record wind speed, barometric pressure, and other data. If the tornado sweeps directly overhead, the more he deploys, the better the odds. Playing chicken with a twister is a dangerous game. The tornado shreds a nearby farmhouse, a reminder of what 200 mile an hour winds can do. Still, Tim is determined to deploy the last of his six probes. He was saying that, but I was thinking something else. 
I was already out of the car. I got the probe, I put it on the ground, I jumped in. I deployed in five to seven seconds. Then suddenly, the tornado turns on them. It's coming back on the road. It's coming right at us, too. We gotta put it on. Twisters can accelerate at speeds of 70 miles an hour. This one is only 100 yards away and bearing down fast. Listen to it! If it catches up, it'll fling their van through the air, then crush it like a tin can. The driver puts the pedal to the metal, but the tornado seems to be gaining. The twister chases the van down the road, then, at the very last second, veers away and loses steam. They escape unharmed. Not everyone is so lucky. It's only after he downloads the data from his probes that Tin learns how close they came to the belly of the beast and certain death. This is the one at the corner of the house. This is absolutely amazing. From the time I turned, turned it on to maximum pressure, 82 seconds. Oh my gosh. 82 seconds this is all we have. have. This is all we have. 82 seconds from the tornado center, but mere moments from its outer clutches. Any delay, and the tornado could have sucked the men into its deadly vortex. Tim came within yards of the most violent winds on the planet, and his own mortality. It's certainly the closest I've ever been to a tornado, and I don't ever want to be that close again. But sometimes, there's no escape. Wild animals fascinate and amaze us. But get too close, and you could pay with your life. The world's top cameramen can't run scared. Dangerous beasts are part of the job. Oh, boy. In Deadly Encounters, we'll share amazing stories of filmmakers who get closer to the kill zone than you would ever dare. But even pros can get too close. To get the shot, these guys will face off with animals they can't even see. Serpents in the jungle. Creatures of the deep. Moments straight out of a horror movie. But these scenes are for real. Ever wonder what it's like to look death in the face? Nature's carnage doesn't phase wildlife filmmakers. Blood and gore are part of the job. But every now and then, a cameraman sees something so primal, it's shocking. In our first deadly encounter, an unsuspecting filmmaker captures a battle so intense, it gives a whole new meaning to the word raw. Kim Wooliter grew up in the African wilderness. He's no stranger to the grim realities of predator and prey. Tonight, he and partner Dale Hancock plan to film leopards hunting. Dale carries a bank of lamps in his Jeep for lighting the scene. Although it's dangerous to travel alone, the men decide to split up to search for the stealthy cat. If you're not prepared to put up with what nature throws at you, you probably shouldn't be out here. Wooliter thinks he may have found what he's looking for. But leopards aren't the only predators out hunting tonight. And these aren't leopards. Sounds of killing and carnage surround him. There's an epic battle going on in the darkness. But without lights, 
Bulleter can only listen to the attack. Moving up there, I need those lights in a hurry before they pull this thing down. Yeah, okay, I'm coming. Although most of us would freeze in horror, this seasoned pro is determined to capture the scene on film. He needs Dale's help fast. The battle's getting fiercer. Bulleter hopes the hunters don't turn on him. Finally, Dale arrives. Eight mile lines, yeah. Only yards from Wooliter's Jeep, an incredible struggle. Eight lions attack an enormous buffalo, but the animal refuses to die. For almost an hour, the buffalo fights back as the lions begin to eat him alive. Awestruck, Wooliter films while the pack eviscerates the giant beast. They go for the jugular. These lions like their meat rare. This is pure primal appetite, and Wooliters caught it all on film. This is what it's all about. Hanging in for moments like this. Scary looking lion. This guy's gotten incredibly close to film an extraordinary battle. It's an amazing scene of predation. You might be willing to film the pain, but how about feeling it? Our next deadly encounter pits man against beast. Okay, I mean, I'm worried about this. Herpetologist Brady Barr is about to meet a legendary snake, a giant python that has been stalking a town in northern India. This silent hunter strikes without warning or fear, devouring animals as big as children. So he saw a python actually attack a small cow, a calf, and kill it. The townspeople want Brady to catch the snake and take it away. Brady's faced off with fearsome animals before. Wow! This may be the biggest one we've ever captured. But he usually manages to keep the upper hand. God, I guess he's a little freaked out about me. Today, he may meet his match. If Brady can find the snake, he'll need to wrestle it into submission before it snares him with its coils. Where could the python be hiding? Being ambushed by a constrictor can be a deadly business. The snake would bite Brady with four rows of backward-facing fangs, while its thick, muscular body would squeeze him, stopping the blood flow to the heart in just minutes. Brady's brave, but not stupid. He brings colleague Jerry Martin with him for backup. I've got a huge python. It's the big one. It's the big one. Everybody, wait, wait, wait. Don't come running up. Don't come running up. Okay. It's gigantic. Can you reach it? It's gigantic. It's bigger. No, 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 no. It's as big as my leg. I'm going to need your help. Wait, stop, stop, stop. I'm trying, guys. I'm trying. Okay. Wait, he's tongue flicking. He sees it. The python sees Brady. The tongue flicks are its way of sizing him up. He can sense if Brady will make a good meal. Don't anybody go any closer. Brady's never tackled a snake this big before. It's as long as a pickup truck and can swallow prey four times its width. Brady tells Jerry to grab the head while he goes for the massive tail. I got a bad feeling about this. Okay. You can be sure that either I'll get the head or the head will get me. Two. Go, 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 go,
Hang on to him! Hang on to him! Yeah, I got him, I got him. Ah! It goes after Jerry first. Oh, oh my gosh, watch out, don't let him bite your face. Don't no. let him bite your face. He's going to fun. Then it tries for Brady. Wait, don't let go of that hand. I'm afraid of that hand. Okay. All right, man, he's around my neck. The python squeezes Brady's body with a vice-like grip. His lungs gasped for air. The crew stung. They didn't expect Brady's encounter with the snake to go like this. The python shifts its grip. In an amazing moment, Brady pushes back and regains control. Man, this is the biggest snake I have ever seen. I know. Oh, I found him, baby. Oh. You laugh now. Just a few minutes more, and Brady could have been a goner. <laughs> Valerie Taylor tests a shark's biting power, using herself as bait. That's what they, they teeth do when they get on it. That's the noise you hear. And you really think it's getting into you. You hear that terrible noise, but it doesn't. Filmmaker Valerie Taylor is about to offer herself up as a meal to a band of hungry blue sharks off the coast of California. Why? She's trying out this chain metal suit. It will weigh her down in the water, but if it works, it will protect her from a shark's powerful bite. With several rows of razor-sharp teeth and jaws that close like a steel trap, the blue shark is one of the few species known to attack humans. If this is Valerie's idea of a game, they're more than happy to play along. Valerie lures her subject with bloody chum. A frisky blue shark lunges at the easy meal. At first, the experiment appears to work. The suit is protecting her skin. But Valerie's overlooked something. Even if this one can't chew her to death, that doesn't mean he'll stop trying. Valerie's a rag doll in the jaws of a killer, and the metal suit is weighing her down. I was screaming. All I wanted was someone to punch him off, make him let go. The shark strikes and rips off her metal glove. Then he turns back for more. Valerie makes a dash for the water surface. As she gathers her strength, the crew guards against another attack. He got the glove off, but he continues to let go. I don't know how good I have The thing that happened was. He got the glove off somehow, he just ripped it off. And this hand, this naked hand was in his mouth. So I grabbed, put that hand in, so that he couldn't crunch down on it. I did it just like that, and you, but you can see why he got the thumb. Because it was sticking up. Oh, boy. Well, the only way you learn these things, isn't it? It's by trial and error. Yeah. That was an error. An error she won't quickly forget. But Valerie's close call isn't as terrifying as our next deadly encounter. In our most amazing moment, an underwater cameraman fights for his life against an even more dangerous shark. In the waters of Mexico, a National Geographic team of scientists tries out an innovative device. To get a closer look at the lives of sharks, these scientists hope to attach a remote camera called Critter Cam to the shark's body. 
It's a great idea. Once Critter Can is on the shark, he'll be his own cameraman, taking footage of his life. But to get Critter Cam on the shark, the scientists will have to wrestle a beast with killer instincts. For cameraman and shark specialist Nick Kaluyanis, it will be an unforgettable event. By chance, the scientists haven't caught just any shark, but a bull shark. One of the most notorious hunters in the sea. Hundreds of pounds of lean muscle and rows of serrated teeth make this beast a dangerous creature to aggravate. The team's strategy? One, attach the camera. Two, move to safety. Three, let the shark free. But the shark has other plans. As Nick films, the shark twists left, the restraining line releases, and the animal is free. As the rest of the team scatters, Nick keeps filming. He's confident the shark won't attack unless provoked. But just then, from behind his lens, Nick is surprised to see someone try to hook the animal, but jab it instead. Before he can move, the bull shark turns and comes straight for him. Footage reclaimed from Nick's camera show these chaotic images. The shark bites Nick's leg. Dagger teeth crunch down from ankle to thigh. The camera falls, spinning down to the sand. The shark continues to attack, ripping flesh from Nick's hand. Another diver shouts for help. Shocked, the team realizes Nick is under attack. As they watch, the shark's thrashing pushes Nick's body to the surface. Incredibly, he's still alive. I come to the surface and the shark's still on me and I, I'm getting tired at this point. I'm losing a lot of blood. The crew rush to save him. While the fishermen grab the shark, teammates pull Nick aboard. They didn't expect this. The salvaged film shows them quickly improvise. They use a wood plank as a stretcher. I could see that I had some major problems. I could, I could see right down to the bone, my leg, hand, every, everything was split open. Ligaments were, were torn up. And uh, I just felt like I'm going to need some really good medical attention. Nick's rushed to a hospital. After seven operations and months of physical therapy, he makes a full recovery. He credits his camera with saving his life. You can see when the shark got finished with the camera, I mean, this is almost bulletproof material. It's three-eighths of an inch thick marine-grade aluminum. And these are some of the scratches that the shark made on the outside of the housing. Ever since, I have never complained about housing, camera housings being too big. They can't be big enough sometimes. Incredibly, before the year is out, Nick is back in the water filming sharks. He says he's more wary of human mistakes than an animal he knows and respects. I have no inordinate fears of sharks. I just have uh, much greater caution to my fellow humans. This shark was provoked, plain and simple. is on and you're coming along for the ride dig up a monstrous creature probe the mysteries of the deep uncover secrets from the past and find a famous face lost in time we're about to take you on an incredible journey in search of National Geographic's most amazing discovery. The 
quest begins in the shadows of an ancient kingdom with a discovery to rival the tomb of King Tut. Ancient Egypt, the land of the pharaohs and the pyramids. Thousands of years ago, this kingdom was the center of civilization, but it eventually fell to ruin, its secrets lost. But now, near the pyramids of Giza, a team of Czech archaeologists is about to make an incredible discovery. A sealed tomb almost a hundred feet underground. This burial vault is an irresistible temptation, but some say opening the grave could trigger the mummy's curse. Dr. Zahi Hawass is Egypt's director of the pyramids. Superstition doesn't stop him. We are here to open the sarcophagus. Maybe you'll find a mummy, maybe you'll find uh, more than a mummy. But whoever lies here doesn't want visitors. As sand is cleared from the shaft, the dry clay walls crumble. They could collapse at any moment. There's already been one cave-in. Could it be the curse is coming true? As the grave's outer cover slides back, the lights flicker ominously. Frightened, workers flee. But Zahi won't stop now. Who knows what this tomb could contain? A giant stone sarcophagus covers the body. This is unique because of one thing. This is intact. It was not opened since 2,500 years ago. It happens very rare in our history. Zahi's just dying to look inside. For the first time in 2,500 years, a mummy reappears under intricate beadwork. The burial shroud's in excellent condition, but the discovery's about to get even better. On the walls of the tomb, well-preserved hieroglyphs tell the story of the mummy's life. His name was Yufa, and he was a powerful man, a priest and palace administrator in the waning days of Egypt's glory. His life story reveals priceless secrets from the past. This mummy's stories describe a little-known chapter of Egypt's history. The desert sands hold many secrets. Some stretch back before the dawn of man. Up next, we're on the hunt for an ancient killer, a giant reptile that stalked the Earth 110 million years ago. Dinosaur hunting can be a dangerous business. Few know it better, or are better at it, than paleontologist Paul Serino. Hold on to your seats. By age 43, Paul's already discovered four new kinds of dinosaurs. No mission is too tough for this guy. He ventures farther into the danger zone than most scientists dare to go. Three of those months are going to be spent in 100 degree weather, in dust storms and wind storms, uh, and, and digging uh, until your nails are worn off. Paul heads straight into a dicey area of the Sahara, where bandits are a serious threat. We have items that people want, items that they have killed people for. It's a personal risk going out there. There's no question about it. The vastness of the Sahara adds to the danger. In this endless sea of burning sand, it's easy to lose your bearings and your life. About a third of the way, there really is no pathway. It's to each his own. The desert erases anybody else's tracks. Without roads, Paul uses satellite mapping and gut instinct to find promising sites. The work ahead will make the risky drive seem easy. Paul's team will work 14-hour days in scorching heat. You come walking out of here in two and a half months and you say that is not the hardest thing that I have done in my life mentally and physically, then you haven't tried hard enough. 
Digging up a bone in the desert can be like finding a needle in a haystack. But it's not long before Paul hits pay dirt. He's unearthed an ancient graveyard and an extraordinary skeleton. We have just found a skull that really uh, is about the biggest I've ever seen. Man, it's mammoth. Lying down next to it gives you some idea of the size. The skull is just a little bit bigger than me, so it's, it's close to six feet Oh, my long. gosh. Paul's discovered an amazing creature, the gigantic ancestor of modern-day crocs. Even the most fearsome crocodile walking the earth today is tiny compared to this monstrous beast. This prehistoric super croc measures 40 feet from tail to tooth and could have eaten dinosaurs for lunch. Paul's thrilled by the monster he's uncovered. Working with bone casts, a sculptor brings it back to life. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Oh my God, you're a monster. I've been dealing with static, beautiful, but fossilized bones, individual bones. To see it together is just amazing. Paul Serino digs up Super Croc and shows us the jaws that sent dinosaurs running for their lives. In April, 1912, the world's most famous ship, the Titanic, struck an iceberg and sank in the North Atlantic. More than 1,500 people died. It's hard to imagine a time when this icon was thought to be lost forever. But without coordinates to pinpoint the grave, finding the ship was long considered mission impossible. In 1985, a man named Bob Ballard is up for the challenge. He and a team of French scientists believe they can use a new sonar mapping system to finally find the lost Titanic. But the odds are against them. The search area is over 400 square miles and more than two miles deep. Ballard can't even be sure the sonar is working in these murky depths. After three stormy weeks at sea, the Titanic eludes them. With time running out, Ballard changes his tactics. He sends an unmanned video search vehicle to the bottom of the sea. The cameras transmit footage back to Ballard's ship. Fourteen days pass with no sign. Then late one night, the search monitors come alive. There's something on the ocean floor, two and a half miles down. 73 years after the Titanic set sail, the ship reappears. Bingo! Yeah! Oh, <laughs> Sucker exists! Ballard is king of the world. The wreckage seems frozen in time. A haunting record of hundreds of lives cut short. An anchor. A deck chair. A man's boots. A chandelier fit for a king. There was an immediate outpouring of excitement. And then the whole force of actually being at the very spot where this tragedy had taken place. And seeing the ship it was very, everyone just crashed. Emotionally, everyone just went down the big trough. And we had a simple, quiet service on the fantail. And we felt that. Uh, and, and it was that time I realized that I was deeply affected by it. Ballard's pursuit of an impossible dream has brought the Titanic back to life and shown us ghostly images of an underwater grave. From the depths of the sea to a foreign land, our top discovery tracks a missing person through a war zone. After disappearing for almost two decades, how would this famous face look? Is she still alive? National Geographic photographer Steve McCurry hunts for a beautiful girl he saw 17 years ago. He snapped this famous photo of her, but didn't get her name. She was young and scared 
a refugee from the war in Afghanistan. He called her the Afghan girl. She has become really the icon of the Afghan struggle. Her plight and her situation has really come to symbolize what's happened here over the last two decades. In 2001, the war in Afghanistan has the world's attention. McCurry returns to the refugee camps, determined to find the face from long ago. For weeks, he roams the streets, scouring shops, markets, and schools. The photograph is his only clue. Here's my wife. Yeah? yeah. You're sure? <laughs> his search proves harder than he thought. In this conservative Muslim society, grown women must wear veils. If still alive, the girl would now be about 30 her stunning face hidden from view. We're going to look and see if we can find the records, see if we can find her whereabouts. Luke says for the last three, for this girl. After weeks of looking, McCurry's run out of hope and time. We have a lot of leads still coming in, but I'm going to have to leave today. Been through the camp exhaustively, looking and talking to as many people as possible. We've given it uh, our, really our best shot. But shortly after McCurry leaves, an Afghan refugee approaches the TV crew. He says he knows the girl from the photo. But the woman now lives hours away near Tora Bora, across a border that swallows lives. The man agrees to bring her to a nearby home. Three days later, she arrives. But there's a hitch. Local custom dictates only a woman may enter inside. Right, we'll do that and then we'll, we'll eagerly await. Associate producer Carrie Regan goes forward alone. I remember walking to this back room and there were women sitting around the floor and they gestured to this figure in the back corner and she looked up and I saw these gleaming bright eyes. And for the first time, I thought, you know, we might just have something here. We might just have the Afghan girl. There's one way to know for sure. A new technology called iris mapping. Carrie snaps a photo, which is rushed to a lab in the States. There, experts compare the eyes of the woman with those of the girl. The colored part of the eye is called the iris. The computer maps its subtle pattern. It's as distinctive as a fingerprint. And these two sets match. The Afghan girl now has a name, Sharbat Gula. For years, she's lived in poverty in Afghanistan's countryside, oblivious to her fame around the world. McCurry races back, hoping to photograph Sharbat once again. But one obstacle still remains. Sharbat's a conservative Muslim, now married with three children. Will she be willing to drop her veil? It's hard for Sharbat to understand that she's an icon to the outside world. McCurry talks with her and her husband, explaining that this will bring attention to the plight of the Afghan people. Reluctantly, she agrees to the request. As he sets up the shot, Sharbat drops her veil. The famous eyes flash defiantly, again capturing the attention of the entire world. Sharbat's face reveals the sorrow of war, but for McCurry, it sends a message of both courage and hope. The fact that she's lifted up her burqa and revealed her face to the world, essentially, is sort of a minor miracle. These adventurers have traveled beyond time and boundaries to make amazing discoveries that broaden our understanding of the world. Danger comes in many forms. Daring adventure. Deadly professions. Heroic assignments.
some men and women accept the risks. These are their stories from the danger zone. What would you do if your ship went down at sea? If a base jump went wrong? When the bullets start to fly? Whether expert explorer or ordinary man, response to danger is anything but predictable. In our first story, an ordinary man faces an extraordinary task. The ocean's a cruel mistress. Commercial fishing is one of the world's deadliest jobs. Wicked weather and rogue waves can turn a beautiful day into a deadly disaster. And when the chips are down, a swift reaction can mean the difference between life and death. It was a horrible experience. One I hope I never have to live through again. At 3 p.m. on a cold afternoon, rough seas slam a small fishing boat named the Strider. The crew is in trouble. The waves are getting worse. There are three men on board. Captain Spike Chipperfield, his girlfriend's son Jim, and his uncle Butch. One, two, three monster waves crash into the ship. The Strider's going down. The seas throw Butch and Jim overboard, but Spike's trapped in the engine room. It was so dark I couldn't see and I was disorientated and I banged my head and hurt my knee and my arm. I said to myself, if I stay here, I'm going to die, or I'm going to die trying to get out of here. And I saw a little corner of light about 15 feet below me, so I dove for it. That light is the door to the outside. Spike fights his way to the surface. He and Jimmy cling to the barnacle-riddled boat, trying to open a life raft. The barnacles were like razors, and they were just washing us back and forth like a cheese grater. I almost lost Jimmy in the sea, and I grabbed Jimmy's hand, and then Jimmy scurried back up. The raft pops open. Spike and Jimmy get on board. And when we turned for my uncle, he was about 15 or 20 feet away, but he was already face down in the water, dead, you know? So, so horrific, so devastating. Spike's lost one loved one. He'll have to fight not to lose young Jimmy. He's only 15 years old. These cold seas will cause hypothermia, and Spike's blood could draw sharks. Hundreds of fishermen are lost at sea each year, but Spike won't give up. Just then, a helicopter appears. The Coast Guards heard their mayday call. A camera on the craft captures an incredible shot of a man and a boy struggling to beat the odds. But the danger's not over. The helicopter's rotors generate hurricane force winds. They could actually blow you right off that raft. If the pilots aren't careful, the sea will become an angry whirlpool, tipping the raft and drowning the men. The helicopter backs away and drops a rescue swimmer in the angry seas. They're streaked with boat fuel and blood. His life is just much dangerous as mine when he's in that water. I mean, anything could happen. Spike puts Jimmy's life ahead of his own. Although he's badly injured, he tells the swimmer to take the boy first. Safe. At last, Spike can let the rescuers help him. can't believe the ordeal is over. I mean, it's just, I haven't really found the word to describe that feeling. It's a gut-wrenching, hot-stopping, mind-boggling experience that it just sends you like through a spin cycle. 
Despite terrible trauma, Spikes managed to beat death, saving his own life and Jimmy's. You know, the youngest is always the one you worry about, and I wasn't going to go home without Jimmy. And that's what family's about, and that's what it's about when you love someone. The mortal danger faced by fishermen is well known by adventurer Sebastian Younger, author of The Perfect Storm. Now, after writing about the risks taken by others, Sebastian's decided to tackle a story to test himself. Fall 2000, a civil war rages in northern Afghanistan. Guerrilla fighters battle for freedom against the oppressive Taliban regime. No, because it'll soak up the blood. This war is fought in a remote and unforgiving land. Okay. Not even foreign reporters are safe. Right straight through, huh? Journalists willing to risk their lives must sneak onto the battlefield. To cross rebel lines undetected, Sebastian Younger flies in the dead of night. Sebastian's determined to report on the men trying to topple the Taliban. But that's only part of his mission. He's seeking out danger as a personal test. I wanted to know how I was going to do it. Hey, once I come out of this, I really can call myself a journalist. To succeed, Sebastian must do more than write about the victims of a vicious war. He must go to where these men were wounded and document the horror of the front lines. This is sort of the, uh, the teeth of the thing, the situation that war we're reporting on. This is the very, these are the very front positions. This is where it's happening. Sebastian's partner on the journey is an Iranian photographer named Reza. It's a very quiet day. There's not much shelling. Not, not, no. not yet. Not yet. In a war zone, nothing's quiet for long. Suddenly, rockets start to fly. The Taliban begins to bombard the outpost. Each shell delivers a blast of shrapnel, and on this hillside, the only protection is dirt. A man tells Sebastian where to run for cover. He sprints to the rebel bunkers, but the shells are zeroing in on the target. Fighters shove Sebastian into a foxhole. The rebels fire back. But their scattered machine gun fire does little to stem the Taliban's attack. The shells keep coming. Sebastian hits the dirt. I, I, I suddenly realized in that moment that I'd never been scared before. I'd never really been scared before. This was fear, and it was just blindingly terrifying. This rocket misses. Went over us. Went past us at the other side. But another one can't be far off. Sebastian fears someone's going to die. One more. He hopes it won't be him. I realized, I was sort of cowering in this trench, the idea of testing yourself is an idea that you have when you're back home. That's an idea you have in your own living room. All I could think on that hilltop was, I have no business dying here. Sebastian's not the only one worried for his safety. These rebel fighters don't need a dead American on their hands. A commander orders him off the hill. He said, he said get off the hill.
Sebastian's test is over, but the reality of war for these rebels is far from the end. We got a taste of it. That's nothing what those guys are going to go through tonight. Brace yourself for an unbelievable thrill as our most amazing moment takes you over the edge. Base jumping. An adrenaline pumping plunge into the space between life and death. Where death has the distinct advantage. Australian Nick Federis thrives on that kind of danger. You stand on the edge, you jump off, and in a split second you are instantly transported to really what is one of the most extreme environments on Earth, and there is no turning back. But after 10 years of high-flying thrills, he's got his eye on a new challenge. The world's highest base jump. In July 1992, he and partner Glenn Singleman are with a camera crew at the foot of the Himalayan mountains. Ahead of them, a death-defying leap off this colossal cliff called Great Trango Tower. Oh my God, that is so big. Trango Tower looms almost four miles above sea level. Its sheer granite face alone is 6,000 feet, almost five times the height of the Empire State Building. It will take weeks to climb up, mere seconds to plummet down. Along the way, Trango tests Nick's limits as a mountain climber. After more than 20 days of climbing, they finally reach the summit. But the biggest challenge still lies ahead. They rappel down in search of a launch site. Tons of this snow and ice could break off at any minute and crush them. They know they're on borrowed time. They find a ledge and clear it of snow and rocks, making sure it's a clear shot to the glacier below. Without chutes, it's just 10 seconds to impact. Oh, we can do that. I'd call that a big warm base jump. Nick and Glenn strap on their gear and come face to face with the edge of the world. Nick has 15 pounds of camera equipment built into his helmet. Cameras strapped to his chest and leg will also capture their attempt at the world's highest base jump. Something's wrong. The weight of the camera causes Nick to tumble out of control. His body needs to be flat and level. Otherwise, even if he deploys his chute, it won't inflate. He is four seconds from impact, traveling at 180 miles an hour. It's his last chance. been on my back on a base jump before but I was in control when it mattered and I feel great all I could think is that life is sweet so sweet
Let's look back at our stories from the danger zone. These brushes with death remind us of the thrill of being alive. Just live through National Geographic's most amazing moments. Unexpected killers on the prowl. Fighting for life against the planet's most dangerous forces. Deadly encounters with ferocious beasts. Get him off that dude. Cough. The quest for awesome discoveries. Pushing human limits in the danger zone. Truly amazing.